Warning, the following episode contains descriptions of murder, torture, and adult language. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello everyone, welcome back to the CMP podcast. I am your host, Christina Plord, as always. How are you guys doing today? It's Sunday, it's about 5.50 at night, and I am exhausted. I have a massive glass of coffee next to me and some water, gotta stay hydrated. Um, It was midterms this week, so I was doing midterms, interviews, a bunch of other stuff, so I just felt like today was a good just record and relax day. We did my mom's birthday because her birthday's tomorrow, but I have my internship and stuff, um, so I'm not going to see her, but we did a little brunch and stuff, and yeah, it was nice. It was a good, like, relaxing Sunday. I hope you guys had a great Sunday. Um, make sure you guys follow our Instagram and our Twitter and keep sharing and listening. Let me know what you guys think. As always, I appreciate your support so much. And I literally, I love doing this. Um, I look forward every week to just sitting down and talking about this stuff because it is my passion. It is what I like to do and what I like to talk about. Um, there's such a big community about it and, it's just an interesting topic to discuss and bring awareness to because it's some of the shitty shit that's going on in our world. Um, and I feel like it needs to happen. It can't be something that we ignore because in order for things to change, you need to bring awareness to them and bring awareness to what is wrong in society, in your country, wherever you are. Um, so yeah, so what? We're going to hop right in. Today's case is called the Hi-Fi Murders. So before we get into it, I want to be honest. It is quite graphic. So if you don't do well with like torture and stuff, here's your warning. I will not be offended. It's not it for anyone. Um, I think the misconception about true crime is that and like why some people are like, oh, why would you do that? Is that it's like easy to talk about. It's not easy to talk about. It's not hearing the this thing, like hearing the things that these people go through and hearing about them is not easy. But how do you think it was for them? And I'm not talking about it to be disrespectful to um, read about it and because there are sick people who like reading about the way people are tortured and it makes them excited. It doesn't make me excited. It makes me sad. Like that's terrible. But in order to bring awareness to these shitty things in life and to what happened to these victims, it's things you need to discuss. So like I said, before we get started, and I always put a viewer discretion warning at the beginning of my podcast, just in case, um, because you never know who's listening and stuff. You know, like, there's so many different things that are in true crime that some people might not want to listen to them, you know? Like, someone might not want to hear about a torture story. Someone might not want to hear about a uh, mass murder. Someone might not want to hear about kidnapping, but they want to hear about something else, you know? So everything's different. You gotta put a warning, you know? I realize I said you know a lot, and I don't even realize I'm saying it until like after and then I'm listening back to these and I'm like what is wrong with me I don't know I don't know so let's get right into it um my information I got from Murderpedia I got from ABC in Utah because this was set in Utah so it's like you know how every state has like their ABC channel so there's this ABC4 and it's from Utah um and then also good old wikipedia and if you guys don't granted wikipedia they are like it is super easy to edit but for the most part they are very accurate and they're very good at it wikipedia it's it's a free encyclopedia like it's there for information you read about this stuff it's a great tool donate if you can or just you know share their website and links to donate for other people because it is a great tool 
but always fact check your stuff because you do never know you know and that's what i'm here for i'm here to fact check them. i'm here for you i'm here so you don't have to sit there and google and go down a dark rabbit hole like i do it's, it's bad I stay up till three in the morning reading about this shit i swear maybe that's why i have nightmares hmm, i don't know so let's jump right in so the hi-fi murders were so we're just gonna do like it today's see i should put this in as a disclaimer as well so today's episode is gonna be a little different so there's not a lot of information about the perpetrators um very basic information of like where they were from um their names where they were born blah 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 you know so we're really just gonna like jump right in like there's no like leading up to it like you know how other stories that we've talked about it's like okay so this is what they were like as a kid and this is what they were like as a teenager and this is what they were like as an adult and then they met this person and this happened and this happened, and then the crime happened no that's not today my dear friends it we are jumping right in right the fuck in okay the Hi-Fi murders were the brutal torture and killings of three people during a robbery at the Hi-Fi shop, which was a home audio store in Ogden, Utah, on the evening of April 22nd, 1974. When they say home audio shop, I really just, like, imagine, like, a Best Buy. That's, you know, I don't really know what, because what else would it be? Like, speakers and stuff, you know? Um... Several men entered the hi-fi shop shortly before closing time and began taking hostages. Um, two ended up surviving, but they had very severe life-changing injuries that, um, obviously, like, they never really recovered from. So, it's still, even though they lived, it still, like, altered their life physically and emotionally. Because even if they didn't have an injury, like, what they go through, it's that takes a lot to get not even get over just to deal with and address so you can try and in a way move on um but yeah so it was it just they basically ruined their lives which is really upsetting um so yeah so that's a little precursor to what is to come so here we go jumping right in April 22nd, 1974. Dan Selby Pierre, William Andrews, and Keith Leon Roberts, and three other men drove in two vans to the Hi-Fi shop at 2323 Washington Boulevard, Ogden, just before closing time. Those are the names of the people. So, Dale Selby Pierre, born January 21st, 1953, in Trinidad. William Andrews, born 1955. So you see what I mean? Like, we, you don't have all the information, but you have all the information about the crime, but not about the people. That's what I noticed. This is one of the first ones that I noticed that's like, you don't really get a lot of backstory. Does that make Like, you don't really know who the, like, they just jump right in. They're just like, okay, so they're this age, and this is what happened, and that's that. And this is what they're working at. And that's it. So, I don't know. It's not like before. It's not like other ones. Um, Keith, oh, so William Andrews was born in Louisiana in 1955. They don't, it wasn't really, doesn't really tell you on the websites that I found, like, exactly where. Um, and then Keith Leon Roberts, who was born January 5th, 1955. Four. they said in Oklahoma um because that's just where he died so they assume like the information I found they like assumed that's where they were from um but that is from Wikipedia that I really didn't find anything else on like on Murderpedia they just do the same thing they just kind of jump right in they don't really they just say um the crimes were committed by Two 19-year-old United States Air Force Airmen, Pierre, Dale, Shelby, and William Andrews. Um, they don't mention anything about Keith Leon Roberts. So, you know, there's some information, there's some not. So, um... Next. So, when they... So, they entered the store just before closing time and they 
all had handguns. Um, so two employees, Daniel Walker, age 20, and Michelle Ansley, age 18, were in the store at the time and were taken hostage. Pierre and Andrews took the two into the store's basement and bound them, and the gang then began robbing the store. So that's Pierre, Andrews, Roberts, and the three other men who were driving the vans. Um, Later, a 16-year-old boy named Byron Courtney Nasbitt arrived to thank Stanley Walker for allowing him to park his car in the store's parking lot as he ran an errand next door. He was also taken hostage and tied up in the basement with Walker and Ansley. So he was never, like, he didn't work there. He was just, like, it was just his friend. And he was like, hey, like, I don't want to park over there. Can I just park in front of your store? And the guy was like, yeah, sure, I don't care. And he was just coming to say thank you. You know, just being a a gem, being polite. And this happens. Ugh. So later that evening... Oren Walker, Stanley Walker's 43-year-old father, became worried that his son had not returned home and went to the store. Um, Byron Nasbitt's mother, Carol Peterson Nasbitt, also arrived at the shop later that evening looking for her son, who was late getting home. Both Oren Walker and Carol Nasbitt were taken hostage and tied up in the basement. So they were tied up for, like, like, they were held for a while. Um, which is... Like, I can only, like, you're just like, oh, okay, so they're robbing me. I feel like it probably gets to a point where it's like, oh, okay, they're just robbing me. Like, it's okay, I'm going to get out of this. And then it's not what happens, which is, um, uh, <laughs> I, like, don't, like, there's part of me, like, I'm, I want you guys to learn about this because this is a case that I didn't even know about i had never like if you guys have heard something about it please let me know i've never heard anything about this i found this in one of my dark hole trips on the internet so and it's like graphic and like what these people went through so it's like i don't want to say it out loud because it's just so sad but i want you guys to know about it you know does that make sense um so now they have five people. Five people in the basement, all held hostage, and they're just ransacking these store, this store. So Pierre told Andrews to get something from their van, and Andrews returned with a bottle and a brown paper bag which, from which Pierre poured a cup of blue liquid. Pierre ordered Oren to administer the liquid to the other hostages, but he refused and was bound, gagged, and left face down on the basement floor. Um... So, yeah, so he tried to take one of the hostages and being like, you're going to make them drink this. And he was like, uh, no, I'm not doing that. And he just, like, did it. Like, I don't, I don't know. Ah. So, um, so Throckmorton was the, so George Throckmorton was a detective that was dealing with this case. So... Um, he had talked to the killers and he had asked them about the liquid, which it turned out to be Drano. And if you guys don't know what Drano is, it was, it's just the shit like to use to clear out your drain, you know? Um, and so he was talking to Pierre Dale Shelby and Shelby said that he was in the bathroom and saw the Drano there and was just like, oh, this looks fun. Let's make them drink it. Like, what? What? How do you look at that? And like, I, that's like another type of like, like, what? What do you mean? Oh, that's not, that we're not even to the worst. Ready? Ready? Are you ready? Strap in. Um, Pierre and Andrews then propped each of the victims into sitting positions and forced them to drink the liquid, telling them it was vodka laced with sleeping pills. Rather, it was liquid Drano, obviously. I'm just reading my notes that I have here. See, this is what happens. I, re- I write all these notes, and I write everything out, and then I start babbling, and I say stuff that I haven't even gotten to on my notes, and then I reread my notes. And it's like, yes, Christina, we know. You just went over that. Oh. Um... So they, that immediately caused blisters on the victim's lips and began burning their tongues and throats and peeled away the flesh around their mouths. 
<laughs> nice. Real nice. Um, so. <laughs> Ansley, still begging for her life, was forced to drink the drain cleaner too, although she was reported by Oren Walker, which was the dad of one of the other hostages, um, to have coughed less than the other victims. Um, Pierre and Andrews tried to duct tape the hostage's mouth shut to hold quantities of drain cleaner in and to silence their screams, but the oozing blisters prevented the adhesive from sticking. Um, Oren Walker was the last to be given the drain cleaner, but seeing what was happening to the other hostages, he allowed it to pour out of his mouth and then mimic the convulsions and screams of his son and fellow hostages. So he never swallowed it. But you know how, like, when you're, I mean, I've never seen someone seize. Thank God. I would never want to see someone seize. But, like, liquid comes out around you, like, foam. So he kind of, like, used that to do it. Which I wouldn't have thought of that. Like, that's, like, quick thinking on your feet. And then he just mimicked doing that. But that must be so heartbreaking for a parent to have to, like, fake doing that. But then also watching your son go through that and knowing, like, he's not faking. Like, because obviously as a parent, like, you want to protect them and they're right in front of you. But you can't. Um, so then Pierre became angry because the deaths were taking too long and were too loud and messy, so he shot both Carol and Courtney Nasbitt in the backs of their heads, proving fatal for Carol, but leaving Courtney alive. Um, he then shot Oren Walker, but missed, and then he shot Stanley Walker before again shooting at Oren, this time grazing the back of his head. So he got hit in, like, he got shot in the head, but, like, it, like, literally grazed him, um and wasn't like like he made him bleed but it wasn't like deadly you know, I mean obviously it fucking hurt he just got grazed by a bullet like not saying that doesn't hurt that must hurt so bad but so that's what happened um so Pierre then took Ansley to the far corner of the basement and forced her at gunpoint to remove her clothes then repeatedly and brutally raping her before telling Andrews to clear out for 30 minutes um when he was done he allowed her to use the bathroom while he watched and then he dragged her still naked um back to the hostages threw her like to the ground and then shot her in the back of the head um according to Oren Walker, because he did survive. Her last words were, I'm too young to die. That's, like, she was only 18. Like, she had her whole life ahead of her, and that poor angel, like, that must be so scary. Like, you don't think, I feel like teenagers, especially at that age, you, in a way, you feel like you're invincible. Um, and don't get me wrong, like, it's super sad whenever anyone dies. Like, no one should have to die before their time is ready, before their body is like, we've had enough in a way. So, but I think when it's, like, a child, and I still think you're, like, I remember myself at 18, I was in a fucking adult. Like, you were a child. Like, I was a child. I'm basically still a child. Like, I'm only 23 years old. Um, It's just, it, that, it makes it even worse because they did like they haven't lived their life yet you know it was just like what I talked about in the Mary Bell episode with her killing those two boys um if you haven't heard it go take a look if you'd want to um they have their whole life ahead of them so it makes it even more heartbreaking because they haven't experienced anything in life they're just getting started like she's only 18 she was able to work legally two years before like she's a baby so that like just dying like that is terrible like the just basically just being tortured to death that's terrible absolutely terrible um so andrews and pierre realized that oren was still alive so pierre mounted him wrapped a wire around his throat and tried to strangle him love it well um 
So when this failed, Shelby and Andrews inserted a ballpoint pen into his ear and stomped on it until it punctured his eardrum, broke, and exited the side of his throat. What? <laughs> oh my, I read that and I, my eyes wanted to pop out of my skull. Like, even reading these, like the like any true crime story, the descriptions of the things people have to go through, it's so like inconceivable. It sometimes makes it so hard to realize like that actually happened. Like someone experienced that kind of pain inflicted by another human being. Like that is just fucking mind blowing to me. How another human being can think first of all think to stick a ballpoint pen into someone's ear and stop on it and two to go through with it i don't understand it i really don't <laughs> um so obviously at this point fucking oren's like in pain i assume i mean it doesn't say anything like oh yeah he was screaming but i mean you can only imagine that must fucking hurt so, Shelby and Andrews then went back upstairs, because this was all in the basement, and finished loading the equipment into their van and left. They just left, you know? Which, um, another part that I found, which, this is what I don't understand with this case. So, another part that I found was that Andrews and Shelby or just Shelby, those, I found two different accounts of that, that one of them or the both of them had talked about robbing this store because they had so much, like, expensive equipment there, so they wanted to sell it. Just talks about that. Nothing else as far as killing people, doing anything to the people there, just robbing them. So, no crime is ever okay should never commit any crime at all but what i don't understand is how do you go from okay i'm gonna steal some speakers some tvs I, I mean i assume that's the equipment they stole like i said can't assume but i mean it's a home audio store you can only imagine it's speakers headphones shit like that you know how do you go from being okay with stealing that which I feel like is like on one end of the spectrum to brutally torturing f almost five people to death for some speakers. That's what I don't understand. That's the part which honestly frustrated me that I couldn't find any information from was no explanation from them where it kind of like changed you know like for example like the cheshire home invasion that happened in connecticut and one i don't know exactly which of the guys it was have to look into it we'll probably do the case at some point um but one of them had said that they didn't go in wanting to kill them but the other one kind of like forced him to do it well that's what one guy said and the other one said he just kind of saw them there and he said it was more like something took over him but I mean at least you can find like at least there was a statement to be like okay this is why he said he didn't granted you have to take everything with a grain of salt you're talking about a convicted killer but there is nothing there is no like explanation the only thing I found was Shelby saying that he basically said I, I had shot one person so I just started shooting everyone else so but that was it like there was no like oh like I targeted them or I saw them and I just wanted to kill them like there was none of that so that's what I don't understand that's what I want to know that's like the missing piece of the puzzle but at the same time they, he might not have ever like neither one of them on any of them might not have ever given any information as to why they might have just kept their mouth shut but then that makes it even worse because if you're going to do that to someone at least tell them why you did it 
Does that make sense? Oh, aggravating. So, we're going to talk about the victims really quick. So, Sherry Michelle Ansley, or Michelle Ansley, um... She was born January 24th, 1956, and died April 22nd, 1974. She was 18 and had been hired only a week before the murders. Um, she had recently become engaged, and she they were about to be married on August 5th, 1974. Um, she was raped and shot by Pierre on oh, August 5th. That's the day after my birthday. Look at that. Um... Next one, Byron Courtney Naisbitt, um, or Courtney Naisbitt. Byron Naisbitt, age 16, was a student at Ogden High School. He survived his injuries, but he suffered from amnesia after and was unable to testify. Um, he was able to return to school more than a year after the incident and graduated with his class at the high school in 1976. Um, due to the brain damage from his head wound because he was shot, he was forced to drop out of college. Um, he was on social security assistant because unfortunately he couldn't hold a job because of his brain injury. Um... And on November 15th, 1985, he married a woman named Catherine Hunter. He got divorced, and then he remarried again. Couldn't find who he remarried. Um, and he suffered chronic pain for the rest of his life and died on June 4th, 2002, age 44. So, like I said at the beginning, he was one of the people that had long-lasting physical and mental um, injuries because of this terrible, like, incident. Not an incident, night. You would call it an entire night. It's not just an incident. Because when you say incident, I think of, like, maybe a half hour. This was hours and hours and hours on end. This was torture and super, yeah, gruesome. Um, so, Carol Elaine Nasbitt. So, she's the mom of byron the one that came and was trying to find him because she was like uh hey where are you um she died at the hospital after being shot she was born on december 25th 1921 and died on april 26 1974 um orin william walker he was the father of stanley walker which is the other victim uh he was one of the only people who or he was the only person that was there that night to testify against the perpetrators. Um, he died on February 13th, 2000 at the age of 69. And then Stanley Oren Walker was born on March 19th, 1954 and died on April 26th, 1974. Um, that honestly like reading his whole name was, that was hard too because his middle name is his father's first name um for carol and Oren, i can because they both had kids that were there as they were there um their the fear they must have gone through watching their babies have to experience that and not being able to protect them i can only imagine all of the people that were there michelle she probably wanted her mom her dad like she wanted to be able to say bye to them and she couldn't and when it comes to true crime and murder I think that's the hardest thing to swallow is the fact that these people never really like they were kind of like ripped from reality you know like I'm, anyone dying is heartbreaking but at least with like a disease or an illness that progresses over time you kind of prepare yourself mentally for what's to come. Um, you're aware that it's going to come, whether it's you're going through it or if it's your family helping you go through it. Like, they know. But then when someone's murdered or kidnapped and never seen again, there's a lot of that was unsaid. There was a lot of plans that are never going to happen. There's a lot of, like... Like, they weren't supposed to leave just yet. Like, this should not have happened. Um, 
And I think that's the word. Like, there's people that they didn't get to say goodbye to. Like, you think of what they thought of, like, going through this and sitting there going through this. There's people that will never get to see them again. And just hearing about the victims, I think every true crime story, I don't think it ever gets easier. For me, personally, it's more just always why did they do this? What can we do to stop this from happening to someone else so that these people don't die in vain and that in a way like they died for something um, and not just for the rush for a killer, you know? Because it's not about them. The killer should not be memorialized and looked up to and admired and get book deals and movie deals and interviews no like they should not make a profit over the evil that they brought into this world you know um so the arrest slash the investigation um the bodies were discovered almost three to four hours later when Oren's wife and other son came to the store looking for them um, his son heard noises coming from the basement and broke down the back door while Miss Walker called the Ogden police. Um, Stanley Walker and Ansley were already dead. Carol Nasbitt was taken by ambulance to St. Benedict's Hospital but was pronounced dead on arrival. Byron, although not expected to live, he survived with severe and ir- irreparable brain damage. Um, He was actually hospitalized for 266 days before being released, so it wasn't like he um, was able to go to the hospital, get the treatment he needed, and leave within, like, a week. Um, It was very, it, he was, it's almost like he was reliving it over and over again for at least another 266 days because he couldn't get out you know and there was constant just talking about it like recovering and everything so so if you like nine months of being in a hospital that sounds like torture in itself you know because I like he just wants I can only imagine like he just wants to be home he wants to go home he wants to be with his family he wants to move on with his life and it's just like in a way of being stuck you know because it's like you know you know it's good for you that you're there but you don't want to be there but you need to be there um Oren Walker survived with extensive burns to his mouth and chin, as well as damage to his ear caused by the pen going through his ear. Um, Hours after news of the crime broke, an anonymous Air Force employee called the Ogden police and told them that Andrews had... See, I did it again. I was talking, told something that was still coming up in the fucking notes. And now here it is. So... Andrew, so it was Andrews. I couldn't remember off the top of my head right then. It was Andrews, not Shelby, that um, confided to him months earlier. One of these days, I'm going to rob the hi-fi shop, and if anybody gets in this, the way, I'm going to kill them. Oh, so he had said a little something about killing people. See, I always get ahead of myself. I gotta stop doing that. Um... After that, a couple hours later, two teenage boys were dumpster diving near the Air Force Base where they were stationed and um, contacted the police after discovering the victims' wallets and purses, recognizing their pictures from the driver's license. So, like, the, they posted their pictures on the news. So, these two teenage boys who had been dumpster diving, you know, like, minding their own business, trying to find some cool shit, and they found this, and they found the wallets, but they recognized the faces, which, I mean, kudos to those boys' parents, because they could have just kept their mouth shut and not said anything, but good, you should have said something, you find that. Granted, if I find out my child's dumpster dumpster diving, why are you doing that? (laughs) Don't do that. But, they helped out a case. Because then this kind of led him closer to the Air Force Base. That's the information they needed because the airman that called was like, oh, hey, he said this guy was talking about doing that. And then they found the purses by a by the Air Force Base. I feel like 
It's like, let's get him in handcuffs. Let's go. Let's go. Um, the detective who responded to this scene thought that the killers were going to be in the crowd and like revisiting their crime scene. Um, he kind of put on a little show just to like attract attention. Um, he's speaking dramatically. He waved each piece of evidence in the air with tongs as he removed it from the dumpster. Um, later, he noted that most of the service personnel who gathered around the dumpster stood still and watched in relative silence, with the exception of two men who, like the de- detective was right, were Pierre and Andrews and were the killers, paced around the crowd, speaking loudly and making frantic gestures with their hands. Um, the detective later received an award from the Utah branch of the Justice Department for his use of proactive techniques, which, like, that's fucking smart, because there are a couple cases, I mean, there's a lot of cases, I say a couple, like, it's like five, like, no, there's a lot of cases where the killer likes to go back to the, either the victims, or if, like, the crime scene when the police find it, or where they find a piece of evidence just to like watch them and you can base off their body language like if it's them but I think like some of them who do that they like want to do it for like the rush of it but I think that they were there because they didn't think anyone was going to find them so when they saw the police there they got like freaked out because they didn't think the police were going to find it you know like they weren't revisiting it for like to like for it to be cool like they were like oh shit like we're caught like we're screwed you know um based on the two men's reactions to the evidence being removed from the trash van and the officer's implication of andrew's pier and oh yeah so the officer's implication of andrew's uh pierre and roberts were arrested a search warrant was then issued for them and the police found flyers for the shop and a rental contract for a unit at a public storage facility um they got another search warrant for the the storage facility and they found um stereo equipment from the hi-fi shop identified by serial numbers and they also recovered the half empty bottle of drano Um, And with the collection of evidence, they were then charged with first-degree murder and aggravated robbery. And another airman, Keith Roberts, so you see this is the other guy, who had waited, um, was charged with armed robbery because he wasn't inside the shop. But I didn't find, other than, like, that first sentence, I didn't find anything else about any, like, the three other men that were there. You only heard about the Pierre Andrews and Roberts so I don't know um their trial began on October 15th 1974 in another county and on November 16th 1974 Pierre and Andrews were convicted of murder and aggravated robbery and Roberts was convicted only of robbery um four days after that Pierre and Andrews were sentenced to death, and Roberts was sentenced to imprisonment and was paroled on in 1987. Um, during the trial, it came out that Pierre and Andrews had robbed the store with the intention of killing anyone they came across, and in the months prior to the robbery, had been looking for a way to commit the murders quietly and cleanly. Pierre and Andrews never said anything to the cops. Like, they weren't like, oh, yeah, we did this because of this. Like, you never really heard of, like, a confession or anything. Like, just outright. It was more they found justice, um, evidence and then arrested them. And then just kept finding evidence from there and pieced it together that they went in wanting to kill them. You know? Um, the two then watched the film Magnum Force, where a prostitute played by Margaret Avery is forced to drink Drano and is then shown immediately dropping dead. So they think that that is where they got the idea to do that to them. 
um, that's when they decide it would be a efficient method of killing and decide to use it. Um, survivor Orrin Walker was the star witness for the prosecution, and due to his amnesia, Byron Courtney Nesbitt was unable to testify, and his father, but his father did testify. Byron Hunter Nesbitt did testify. So, he still had someone, like, talking for him, like, um, I think he was able to, like, um, kind of piece some things together, but, I mean, his father also, like, spoke for how he's doing after, right? Like, he couldn't really speak for what he went through on the inside when it was happening, but he could explain how this has changed his life permanently, you know? Um, the official police report stated that six black men were driving two vans. Roberts and another man remained in the car, and Roberts was one who was uh, convicted of armed robbery. And two others loaded the vans, while Pierre and Andrews were the ones who tortured and killed the victims. Um, but detectives only had enough evidence to convict Pierre, Andrews, and Roberts. That I don't understand because, I mean, I don't know what they mean by evidence. Be like, whether they knew who they were. Because I just feel like it wouldn't have been hard to figure out who they were. I mean, unless, obviously, Pierre, Andrews, and Roberts were like, no, I'm not snitching. And they had no video tapes is the only thing that I could think of. Or, like, any, like, correspondence between anyone. So, I don't know. But, they did... Um, so in, on October 5th, 1973, so this is the year before the murders, or, um, or no, it was the year of the murder. No, the year before. Yeah, 1974. Um, so they found out that Dale Shelby Pierre was, um, a prime suspect for the murder of Edru Ed word Jefferson on October 5th, 1973, but the police had lacked, didn't lack enough, or didn't have enough evidence to file charges, and when the murders happened, like the hi-fi murders, Pierre was out on bail for car theft from a Salt Lake City car dealer. Um, Ogden, a uh, police department officer, Delroy White, who is detective when he was working on the case, said that Andrews was the brains behind the whole deal, the one who organized it, and Pierre was the enforcer. Um, and so, they got convicted on November 16th, 1974, and this is, we're still on Dale, um, Shelby Pierre, this is just some, like, post-conviction stuff. Um, so, on November 20th, 1974, he was given three death sentences, one for each of the murdered victims. Um, and while in prison, Pierre changed his name 27 times, reportedly to protect his family name from no notoriety, finally settling on Dale Pierre Selby, um, which is just him moving his first, middle, and last names as his legal name. Um... Now we're on to William Andrews. So Andrews was 19 years old at the time. Um, just to put in perspective, Pierre was 21. Um, so he was convicted on three counts of first degree murder and two counts of aggravated robbery for the crimes. Um, his death conviction was considered controversial because he did not directly kill any of his victims even though he did admit to putting Drano down their throats, he's not the one that pulled the trigger. Um, he was given, on November 20th, 1974, he was given three death sentences, one for each of the murder victims. And, um, and so Keith Leon Roberts, which was the one who was found guilty of aggravated robbery, he, um... The court found that he, at 19, when this happened, had no knowledge or of the murders or role in the murders. Like, he did not know that this is what it was going to be. Um, but he was convicted of two counts of aggravated robbery and sentenced to five years to life. 
He was paroled on May 12, 1987, after nearly 13 years in prison and moved to Chandler, Oklahoma to live with relatives, and then he died on August 8, 1992. So he was the only one who was convicted and was still able to get out. Um, Dale Shelby Pierre died by lethal injection on August 28th, 1987 at the age of 34. Um, at the time of his death, he kind of stated in his will that all of his money, which was $29, was to be given to William Andrews. Um, the, the Desert News reported that moments before um, his execution, he said, to, like he wasn't really talking to anyone but just out loud he said I'll be glad when this is over um so yeah so I mean he had appealed and we're gonna get into that a little bit after um the next thing they talk about with Andrews but he just he knew when he went that like like this is over like he's over it um I don't know. Do you guys believe in the death penalty? I feel like the death penalty is something. It is such a controversial thing. And it's one of those things. It's like you like no one should have to lose their life. But I mean, you did take someone else's life. Do you deserve? Is it like an eye for an eye situation? Do you think they deserve to get a second chance even though they killed somebody? I don't know. I like go back and forth about it all the time. How do you guys feel? Let me know. Um... So, yeah, so when asked if he had any final words, William Andrews said, thank those who tried so hard to keep me alive. I hope they continue to fight for equal justice after I'm gone. Tell my family goodbye and I love them. Um, William Andrews was execute, executed by lethal injection on July 30th, 1992 at the age of 37 after 18 years on death row my thing with that i don't understand why people sit on death row for so long i think we talked about this like last episode or like two episodes ago but i really i still don't understand it um pierre and andrews actually became very notoriously hated prisoners at the utah state prison and particularly on death row they did not like them in 1977 convicted murderer gary gilmore which you if you don't know anything about it i recommend looking into it maybe we'll do an episode on him um was reported to have said i'll see you in hell pierre and andrews as he passed their cells on the way to his execution by firing squad um however the same news the desert news reported that Gilmore's parting words to the hi-fi killers moments before his execution were adios Pierre and Andrews I'll be seeing you directly so it was kind of like conflicting ones but they know something was said along those lines specifically addressing them so I mean he thought he was gonna see them in, per in hell like they hated them um so now we're to their appeals and aftermath and we kind of did it backwards but this is an important part of the story um so following the handing down of the death sentences to pierre and andrews the naacp and amnesty international campaign to commute pierre and andrews's death sentences um, the NAACP, if you don't know what that is, it's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, Pierre and Andrews were both African American men. Um, so, this is where it gets, eh, like, mm. um, the... NAACP demanded that both of their death sentences should be revoked because of racial bias of the trial. They noted that the defendants were both black and the victims and jury were all white. Um, according to Amnesty International, the sole black member of the jury pool was stricken by the prosecution during jury selection. However, it was later revealed that the juror was dismissed because he was a law enforcement officer, personally knew just about everyone tied to the case. Um, so when it comes to that, I definitely agree with the NAACP. Like that is not a fair trial. Um, 
they say like you are right to a speedy trial and a fair trial and a fair trial means you are your jury is members of your peers so that should include everyone in your community i believe there should be all types of people all age age ranges races there should be black people white people old people young people people who i don't know i mean yeah so i don't think um and there should be Hispanic people. There should be Asian. Like, you know, like, you just get into... There should be... It's a jury of your peers. And we live in America. We have so many different races and nationalities and genders and everything that it needs to be a jury. It needs to be a fair jury. So I definitely see their point there. Um, I personally think they 100% have grounds to get the death sentence at least at least the trial redone or the resentencing can't they do that um i don't know if it means like automatically take it away or maybe it means like try again i don't know um andrews also accused the judicial system of racism following the naacp's request um in an interview with usa today he claimed that he had never intended to kill anyone and this was later rebutted when detectives cited a statement by andrews in which he admitted being the one who purchased the drain cleaner and brought it to the store on the night of the killings so they were like hold on that's not what you said to this guy and they came out with their fucking facts um, after Pierre's execution, a petition for a stay of Andrew's execution, which if you don't know what that is, just, that's just basically saying, like, let's hold off, like, give us a little bit more time to win this appeal, um, was submitted to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The Inter-American Commission petition alleged that a handwritten note, um, quote unquote hang the n-word had been found in the jury area during a recess and that the judge had refused a request for a mistrial and a right to question jurors concerning the note so i mean that shows bias if that is true so at that point that should have been when the um the jury gets questioned and whoever it is or whatever they might have to change the jury they might have to put a pause on the trial that should have been when they stepped in um despite these appeals both death sentences were ultimately upheld obviously because i told you they were both killed by lethal injection um in december 19 1996 the inter-american commission found that the united states had violated its international obligations by denying william andrews a trial free from racial discrimination so they were like yeah you definitely you failed it like you failed him this was not what um you agreed to nor what was in your constitution so other than like as far as when it came from that i didn't really see anything as far as like any fines anyone getting fired like for what happened um i didn't really see anything that came out of the inter-american commission finding that um they violated it so i don't know um there's a couple things that this case kind of left behind um which i i found this out and i i haven't seen this on a lot of cases i've seen it on some like as far as like the legacy that the case left um so like there's something like the um i forgot the case but i remember reading about it it was the boy who was kidnapped and that's the reason that we now that they were putting missing children's faces on milk cartons um if you guys remember what it is let me know because <laughs> my mind's blanking right now um so yeah so the legacy that this case left behind um one the fbi trainees at the fbi academy at quantico are taught about the case um it was included as a sample case in the fbi's crime classification manual two the experience of a Courtney Nisbet and his family became the basis for Gary Kinder's book, Victim, The Other Side of Murder, published in 1982. I've never read the book, but I have been interested um, to read the book. Because, like, it's said, it's the other side of murder. It's the other side of it. Like, just like my how my 
podcast is, and I explained that in my first couple episodes, like, this is dedicated to making sure we remember, like, it's not one-sided. There is someone else on the other end of these terrible actions that we read about, and we need to honor them, not honor these people who are doing it to them, you know? Um, and then three, the Hi-Fi Murders were the basis for the CBS television movie Aftermath, A Test of Love, starring Richard Chamberlain and Michael Learned. So, guys, that is it for this story. What do you guys think about it? Do you think they should have had their death sentences changed? Do you think, um, it was racial discrimination? I do think it was racial discrimination because they did not give them a jury of their peers um, or look into finding a, who wrote that no um, that was in a fair trial do I think they still would have been convicted and given at least life in prison 100% they had evidence that they were there that they were the ones who did this there as far as evidence goes I feel like there wasn't really a doubt whether they did it or not it was more the niceties of the trial and the things you're supposed to do when someone goes to trial that they the rights that they have too even as a uh, perpetrator or a defendant so I definitely agree with that. I do think they would have at least gotten life in prison. I don't know if they would have gotten a death sentence. Um, I don't know. It's a very gruesome story. Um, at the end of the day, people still lost, lost their lives and were affected for the rest of their lives. Um, parents lost their children. That's just... It's just the worst of worst, just being tortured for hours. I think that's, like, one of my biggest fears, like, just being tortured or, like, someone breaking into my house and, like, waking up. That's my biggest fear. Um, some people are like, oh, I don't want to drown. Blah, blah, blah. I'm over here. I'm like, please don't break into my house and murder me, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, what do you guys think about this? Do you think they got what they deserved? Do you think they should have had another trial? Email me, comment on my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it may be. Um, as always, thank you guys so much for being here and listening and supporting me. Um, I have already had people contact me about stickers, and if you would like one, please DM me or message me and let me know because I'd love to see it your pictures of where you're putting the stickers. I've had a couple coming already and I think it's pretty cool. Never thought that this would happen. Um, so yeah, so thank you guys for giving me an outlet and listening and hanging out with me and hearing about the shitty shit in the world and listening to my voice and my chair squeak and my dogs bark sometimes, you know, it's a fun time. We're living it up over here. I don't know about you. <laughs> um so yeah so like i said share subscribe message me dm me email me whatever it may be and we'll chat there i'm excited to announce some things for this coming week for halloween well not this coming week but the following week um i think you guys are gonna like what we have up our sleeves and i mean it's halloween week we have to celebrate we have to do some spooky some creepy shit you know so yeah so thank you for listening i hope you guys stay spooky and stay safe and i'll talk to you later bye